not a lot more to say. You got Jesus, you got it all. That means if you don't have Jesus, you got nothing. And if you're sitting in here today, if you're standing in here, if you're singing with us, if you're just here for the coffee, whatever, you need Jesus. You need a deep relationship with Jesus. Everything else falls and fades away. Everything else will fail you. There's nothing without Jesus. You can talk to anybody in here who has Jesus, and they're going to tell you the same thing, that Jesus is the best thing that they have ever done. Father God, as we transition out of worship and this this song that is really just a living testimony as to how amazing you are, Lord God, I just ask you to continue to speak to people in here. I ask that you continue to to touch lives, Lord God. There's so much confusion in the days that we live. There's so much darkness. There's so much that competes for our attention. And sometimes we get led astray and sometimes we forget. But the reality is, is if I got Jesus, if I got you as my Lord and my Savior, my protector, my friend, then Lord, there's nothing more that I need. There's a lot in this world that I don't need. There's a lot in my life. Not just bad things. There's good things in my life, Lord. But I don't need those. They aren't essential. But Jesus, we declare you essential to each and every one of our lives. So Jesus, today, it's all about you. It's all about you being glorified. You are the only reason we're here. And without you, there's no reason to be here. So, Jesus, we thank you. We ask you to guide us. Jesus, we ask that you send your beautiful conviction through the Holy Spirit. We ask that you challenge us. We ask that you change us. We ask all of these things because we have confidence in knowing that you are are a good God. And that's a wonderful place to be in our life. We pray this all in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, King Jesus. And everyone shout it out. Amen. You guys can, can be seated. All right. Well, I don't know the order of service today, so we're just going to mix it up. Sandy said she needed the mic for a phone, so... I'm giving her the microphone. Here's the microphone. We need all of the people. There's a lot to carry. As uh, you probably know, ooh, ooh. as you probably know, there's also a box of cards here. Um, this is Pastor Appreciation. And I've watched on Facebook at different churches and what they have done to help with um, the stuff for their pastor. And we want to appreciate our pastor every day, not just in October, but this is the month. And his wife has run away from us. Oh, there she is. She ran away. She changed places. That's the problem. Okay, we would like all of you guys to come up here and stand. Uh, one thing about me is uh, pastoring is a family affair for those who don't know. Everyone in the family is affected by a pastor. Pastor will give an account in heaven for his sheep, which is all of us, but right along beside him is his wife and his children. And uh, if you've never been a PK, or if you've experienced a PK, it's it's not easy to always have to be perfect in everybody else's eyes and all those things. Same thing with the wife. But they support. I watch Sunday after Sunday before Pastor Jason gets up here at his wife laying her hand on him and praying that God will anoint him and bless him. That's special. And so we were thinking, I was thinking, what could we... How could we do this? And we've been taking an offering, and we're glad for that. And I thought, 
we thought we'd just pass the hat, Pastor, for a, an offering for you. So we've passed the hat, and uh, these hats are, are different ones. Uh, my husband's going to bring Pastor's hat. He's always, to him, he's always talking about tacos. <laughs> <laughs> and so we got him a little taco shells and some taco sauce and some goodies in there for his hat. And then and the pastor's too? wife, uh, that is Miss Amy, and she always, um, always she wears hat, hats a lot, and she's the one that gave me the first inspiration. But you'll notice there's a game in there. Yeah, no, that's hers. This game is, uh, read it, uh, Amy. What is that game that we have in there? Taco versus burrito. <laughs> so they could play that game while they're sitting around. And um, Mr. Uh, Levi, his is the black, he has the funky hat. We <laughs> figured he had. Somebody, uh, Miss Reva, especially thought there would be something appropriate for you. Everybody, hold it up. It's hairspray. <laughs> and the other thing in there is gel. For his <laughs> Okay, we thought that happened. And then finally, Miss Zana. And uh, we figured, yeah, we figured her hat would appreciate bucks, you know? And so, dollars. And we have... Uh, uh, <laughs> And some goodies in there. And uh, we have some movie tickets for, there's a lot of good movies coming up. Uh, Best Christmas pageant ever is coming up next week. You got to go see it by Dallas Jenkins, uh, the one that wrote, uh, that does The Chosen and everything. And there's some other good ones coming up before Christmas. So, and finally, Miss Georgie, would you present that? We want to, this is Miss Gail, our uh, resident florist that is starting this ministry with us and doing this. And what a beautiful, gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous bouquet. Can we have a hand for that? <laughs> and then uh, we have a number of cards that Blair's going to give you. We love you, Pastor. Everybody loves you, Pastor. Stand up and tell him. Oh, goodness. Okay, we're the pastoral team, and we're going to pray over them, and we want you to pray with us. <clears throat> Father God, we just give you thanks and praise for this family and for Pastor. Lord, we ask your blessing upon them, your encouragement upon them, and just more of the Lord upon them. Father, we thank you for bringing them here. We thank you, Lord, for their shepherding hearts, each one of them, Lord. And I just ask, Lord, that your grace and your mercy and your love would just pour over them, Lord God, in greater measure. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, you're welcome. <laughs> this is a, uh, honestly, it's, this is an easy church to pas pastor. I guess you guys are very good sheep. Um, but no, really, uh, for the most part, I have people that, that have surrounded me 
that do so much, that really take so much off of my plate um, so I can concentrate on the things that I need to concentrate. Um, and that's just not always how churches function, but I am, we are blessed to be a part of this church because we are very much a part of this church just as you are. Um, so thank you to, to everyone. You guys mean a lot to us. Kids, now you guys get to go down with, hey Jordan, are you going down too? Yep. Oh goodness. So Jordan and Levi are the adults downstairs, <laughs> so it's going to be a fun, this is going to be the best, this is going to be so much fun. Um, no, it'll be great. So kids have fun, Levi's got a super awesome um, teaching today, and I know Jordan always does, so that'll be good. For us, we've got a couple couple announcements. Trunk or Treat's coming up this week, isn't it? So we have a great sign-up. Um, bring more candy the day of if you want to. Come on in. You can Really, you can get here as early as you want to, sign, or to set up. Um, I think we officially start at 4, um, but it'll be good, so please... Come on out, and, and if you're not signed up but you have kids or grandkids or neighbor kids, bring them. Um, we like to do it early so they freeze up the rest of their evening and things like that. And then on November 4th, um, that Monday, um, I think something large is happening November 5th, um, Tuesday. So on the 4th, we're going to gather here. At 6 p.m., we're just going to open up the door so that we can pray for our nation. Um, and there'll be a lot of other churches that are going to be doing this same thing. So the more people we can get here to pray, the better, obviously. And it's just a good time to get together and, and come together and, and pray. Um, so please just stick that on your calendar and just be intentional about coming to that a um, couple announcements for the cafe that, that I was asked to, to put up here. Um, yeah, that's about it. So um, what we're finding happening at the cafe is, is that 10 minutes before service, everybody just loads up. I mean, they're like, hey, I'll get there 10 minutes, five minutes beforehand, and I'll grab a coffee, but there's a whole lot of traffic, and it backs the cafe up. Um, so what we would love for you guys to do is come early. Early looks like that side. You can just walk up and get your coffee, and then you can actually hang out and talk to people, get to know more people. Um, it's a great time. So if you can come a little bit early, that also allows those that are working in the cafe to be able to get to service earlier, right? If, you, if you've ever noticed, it's like, man, I know so-and-so's here, but where are they? They missed most all of worship. Well, they're, they're still in the cafe doing what they need to do. So if you can, set your alarms for 15 or 20 minutes early and just come to church a little bit early. There's always great people here. Um, I know with the days they get short, it makes the mornings feel different because it's like it's 7 o'clock and it's still pitch dark. Um, well, we live in Montana, and that's just the way things are. But if you can, come early. Also, if you have been coming here and you're like, boy, I wish I could get involved somewhere, or you feel like you should get involved somewhere, the, the cafe is in need of cashiers. And that's an easy way to step in. You don't got to run the fancy espresso machine or anything like that. Um, but we need a couple, three, four more cashiers to get on the rotating schedule there, right? So you don't have to be here every Sunday by any means. You got to be here like once a month to, to do that. And there's absolutely 100% training involved in that. But it's, it's all the fancy stuff, right? It's the push buttons and, and all that. So it's, it's, it's a super eat the what? Push buttons. Well, they're not even buttons anymore, are they? Because they're on a tablet. Gosh, all this new technology has to change how we say things. It's, it's, it's a great opportunity. So if you're interested in that, see John or Mel or Levi, um, and they'll get you plugged into that. They'll get you trained and on the schedule. All right. And then we have a couple more announcements that I didn't have time to do slides for. Um, Chi Alpha is having a swing dance, whatever that is. 
because I'm not a dancer nor a swing dancer. Um, but it's November 9th at the Kleffner Ranch, and it's a fundraising opportunity for them. It's $10 to get in unless you're a Carroll student. Then you can get in free. It is in the bulletin. Um, if you want to go out to support them, awesome. If you want to go out there and swing dance, um, Dan and Carolyn, I just feel like you guys swing dance. Do you guys swing dance? I saw you at the wedding. I saw how you were dancing at the wedding. You could probably give all these youngsters lessons. So you guys need to show up there and, and wear your fancy stuff and, and all that. But, but it's a great way to support Chi Alpha. And then Pies for Missionaries, we're doing that again this year. Well, we're not doing that. Sandy Badger is doing that. Um, so if you need pies, if you're like, oh, this Thanksgiving, there's so much to do. I wish I could just get a good homemade pie. You can. You can sign up in the foyer. And I was looking. Oh, my goodness. There are so many options. It's not like sign up for a pumpkin pie or an apple pie. There's like banana cream, coconut. I mean, there are so many different pies. Sign up for that. And then um, the, the money that's raised for that will go to our own McKinsey, who is getting ready to go to stands, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, one of the stands, several of the stands. Um, but we'll be able to raise money for her, and you'll get a sweet, tasty pie, um, and you won't have to worry about that. That is pretty much it for announcements, um, except for we've had a clump of birthdays lately. We've had, uh, we have two birthdays tomorrow and one birthday last week. So Bruce's birthday was last week. So make sure you tell him, hey, happy last week birthday. But Blair's birthday is tomorrow. And those two were obviously born in the same year because it's a big one. It ends in a zero. So they're both 70. And that's exciting. That's something to, ooh, good job. Good job making it to 70. And then tomorrow is also Charmaine's birthday. And Charmaine will be 29 tomorrow. So we have to, so we have a, uh, I'm talking about not biologic age, how you act age. You act like you're 29. So that's, that's, well, that may not be. Today is last Sunday, so um, we have our potluck after service, so that'd be a great time to wish all of those people happy birthday. And uh, if you're new to our church and you're like, what is this whole last Sunday's thing? I didn't know anything about it. Stay fellowship with us, eat with us, laugh with us, um, just hang out with us, but it's always a fun day, and that happens the last Sunday of every month. All right, we got four ways to give. Like always, give online, or actually through our app is the very best way to give. Um, you can text the amount to 84321. You can use the giving boxes, or you can mail it to 725 Granite Avenue. Um, even that goes with that last song that, that Dave's saying, you know, it's, man, if I got Jesus, I got everything. And, and if we got Jesus, we understand that our finances don't control us, right? Um, the love of money uh, doesn't tug at us as hard when we have Jesus and we're, we're completely um, just committed to him. It changes our perspective on everything. And I, I love that about our Christian walk is that it changes our perspective on everything. There's a lot of things that transfer from, oh, I have to do this, to I want to do this, and I get to do this. And giving is one of those. So if you've never been a giver, if you've never tried it, I would encourage you to do so. 621 is still going on, and it will continue to go on. So hopefully you guys are, are committing to that prayer time. I say 20 to 60 minutes a day, but man, if you've never prayed and you're praying for 10 minutes a day, good for you. You're doing awesome. That's six days a week, and then we gather here on Sunday. Two times out of the week, you just pray with somebody around you, somebody else. It could be a stranger. It could be a close friend. It could be a person in need. It could just be whatever. We try to shoot that we do that twice a week, and then once a week we sow a seed, right? 
That's not very hard. One time a week, we share a testimony or bring Jesus into a conversation or, or model Jesus in some way or another. And uh, I, it's just, it's easy stuff. I mean, biblically speaking, in the commitment level that we see in the disciples, especially in the book of Acts, um, they would have laughed at 621, wouldn't they? They'd be like, what? You mean per day? It takes six to one to do it per day, but uh, but things have changed, and and there's there's busyness and all those things. But I believe in you guys, and and uh, six to one is one of those things that if you're committed to it, it will change your life. And the biggest way that we can judge if it's changing your life or not is is when we when we're committed to it and we do it for three or four or five weeks in a row, and then for some reason we go on a vacation or things get get super busy and we we don't get to do that 621 stuff then we can really experience how much it's actually affecting us when we have done it and then we don't do it right if you guys are anything like me you you understand that completely let's get moving into this message i love this message i've been waiting to do this message for well over a year and god just kept saying not yet not yet not yet and uh uh, a week and a half ago, right around last Sunday, he was like, now, now it's time. Now it's time to bring out 23. Maybe I'm just a numbers guy, right? 6, 2, 1, 23, all of those things, but it's good. Let's pray. Father God, so gracious that you allow us to meet with you. And Lord God, we come here and we can come here and we can meet together all we want, but Lord God, what blesses us is you convene with us. He said, where two or three are gathered, you are there also. We know that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, so wherever we go, the Holy Spirit goes. And Lord God, we come together in this time and, and we get to hang out before service and talk to each other and really really share victories and needs and concerns and and uh, all of those different things. And, and then we get to come in and we get to meet together and sing together in worship, Lord God. We get to experience that together, not just within the body, but with the head of the body. And that's awesome. And we love it. And then we, then we transition in a time of, of, of breaking down your word by opening it up and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us within that. So, Lord God, help us to hear what you have for each one of us. Lord God, help us to move past those distractions um, of the world and let us come in here and fully focus on you with ears to hear what you would have to say to each one of us. Give us the wisdom to process that, that what we're hearing. Give us the boldness to implement that into each one of our lives. Holy Spirit, allow me to hear you clearly and to speak what you would have for me to speak. Shut my mouth with everything else. And once again, like I always pray, don't let anybody leave here the same way that they came in. Lord, don't let them leave the same way. Let that baggage be, be yielded to you and, and the garbage, let that be thrown out today. And Lord God, if there's questions and concerns, Lord God, let those be answered. But most of all, let the presence of your Son be so contagious and so powerful in each one of us. There is no way that we could leave here the same. We pray this in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everyone shout it out. Amen. Well, we're living in quite the times, aren't we? We're living in this tumultuous time, it feels like. And, and, uh, and I'm sure it's always been that way, where, where people have always had a sense of, wow, things are a little bit weird, they're a little bit crazy. We can look back into history and say, oh, I wish I lived in the 50s. It's, everything was so, so easy then. But they had their issues as well in the 60s and 70s. And I mean, boy, if I could just been been born a century ago and I could have been in Montana with a ranch and a horse and a herd of cattle, everything would have been great, right? We sometimes look back and we think that, except there was dysentery and, and uh, freezing winters and, and all of those things. So our perspective is always one of, boy, we got it weird right now. These other times were probably so much better when in actuality they probably weren't. But we do have to admit, we're living in crazy day times. We really are. 
And we always like to have a, a perspective of hope, right? And we, we transfer that perspective of hope within um, how my life is going to turn out next year, right? 20, I can't wait till 2025 gets here. Things are going to be so much better. Well, if you got Jesus, things are so much better right now. Boy, in 2020, we all wanted to get to 2021 because 2020, boy, there was craziness going on. It was a time of uncertainty and, and everybody was in a panic. But then 21 wasn't that great. We just got to get to 2022. Eh, just kind of kept sliding. 23, gosh, 23 is going to be the year. It's going to be great. We kind of made it through 23, and everybody was saying last year, they were like, we want more in 24. 24 is going to be amazing. And 24 comes about, and, and uh, well, we've seen hurricanes and forest fires and all of those things, and we've seen civil unrest, and we've got wars going on in, in two parts of the world, and famines and things like that, and, and we are living in tumultuous times. It's definitely a time, though. It's a time of excitement, right? Depending on your perspective, if you're a follower of Jesus and you've read the book, you've read the entirety of the book, especially the book of Revelation, you know that it's a time of excitement. But even for the Christian, it's a time of confusion. It's a time of expectation, I believe, right? Because we have that eternal hope. But it's also a time of even disorder. Things feel a bit disorderly right now. And when I look around, you know, I, I, I walk around town, I, I watch what's going on, I listen to conversations. I guess that's eavesdropping, right? You're not supposed to do that. But, but we all do. And we allow that, we process that. And, and when I do that, I, it, it, there just seems to be so much busyness. So much busyness. And there are those out there and they seek to push ungodly agendas that are at their core undoubtedly evil. There's, there's those that are abounding among us. And a lot of those are slaves. A lot of those people pushing those agendas, they're slaves to the enemy and they don't, they don't even know it. Some of them do, but a lot of them don't. But there's also those who are fervent about their relationship with Jesus. And it seems like the, the more chaotic the world gets, the more solidified their faith becomes. And they commit themselves to prayer. And they commit themselves to the Word. And they commit themselves to being salt and light. But I would say the largest population, at least within our nation, seems to be those who, well, they just, exist, right? They go day to day. There's just this existence. And, and for the most part, it's a self-induced apathy. They've just checked out, right? They just go about their lives, not too disturbed, as long as they are not directly effective. Have you noticed that? Man, in the past, it seemed like one little thing affected us all. And now, We've got stuff happening at, at such a, a fervent pace. And people will check out, that, man, that, if I'm not directly in, involved, man, if I can still go hunting or, or boating or, or uh, man, I can still get a good steak and everything's just well and good in my life. And this includes all walks of life. And it very much includes those who call themselves Christians. And yet... All of us are affected because everyone is profoundly affected to some extent. So no matter what's going on, we are going to feel the effects even if we want to stick our head in the sand like an ostrich and pretend like everything's great and my life is great and my family is great. Those things outside of us will definitely affect us for the Christian as well as the atheist. Today we're going to focus on the Bible-believing, born-again Christian. So if you can define yourself as a Bible-believing, born-again Christian here this morning, praise the Lord. This message is for you. But if you're sitting here going, I don't know about all that. I don't know about the whole Bible-believing thing. I don't know about the born-again Christian thing. 
I want you guys to pay close attention because it will reveal to you something that you can have and attain within your lives. Because I'm going to be the first to admit, sometimes the battles we face, because of our faith, it just brings a weariness. Anybody experiencing any weariness in here today? There's so many people. And that's, it's such a great descriptive word. It's weariness. Oh man, I'm just tired. There's, there's nothing that I can specifically put my thumb on. Or maybe there is. But it seems like we live in a time where it's just weariness. What's going to happen next? God, where are you? God, God, when will you show up to, to rapture your church? I'm, I'm in need right now. I have, I have a chronic illness, chronic pain, chronic financial issues, chronic emotional issues, something. And we just become weary. Yet, we are to stand steadfast within our relationship with Jesus Christ. The constant attack and the struggle that the world as well as those around us exude against us has a draining effect to even the most ardent Christ followers. That's our first admission, right? Just because we call ourselves Christians doesn't mean our life is perfect. Just because we, we come to church and we do, in fact, pray and we worship and we get into the Word... Just because of all of those things, that doesn't mean we are removed from the perils of this word, world. So even the person who is doing everything right by a Bible-believing, born-again standard, they still can become weary because of the environment that we live in. As we all know, we are seeing this occur and play out simply because each one of us are in the midst of a battle. And it's the age-old battle between good and evil, between right and wrong, it's between righteousness and desecration. If we have kingdom eyes, we are able to discern these things. That's why we should always pray every single day for wisdom and discernment so that the Holy Spirit will help us to discern the times, to discern the situations. And there is no doubt that we are seeing this battle play out within the context of politics right now, right? A couple of weeks, we won't have to talk about it anymore. We won't have to listen to the, the commercials. We won't, have to, we won't have to hear about those things. But, but honestly, if we step back and we just look at the uh, political arena, we can see that there's a battle raging within this world, within this state, within this nation right now. And the elections, yeah, they're only days away, right? And the consequences have the potential to bring security or instability. And with most things, those who will be most aware, as well as those that will be most affected, are those who are followers of Christ. And I say that simply because as a born-again follower of Christ, we have double vision, right? We have the, the original vision that we see this world as because we're a part of this world, but when we get born again, we now gain kingdom vision. So we see things from Jesus' perspective. So that gives us a different idea of the things that are going on in this world and the instability. Just a quick side note here. I, for one, I do not believe any politician or political movement is holy or righteous. I just don't think they are. It's all based on man's desires and agendas driven by pride and selfishness and greed and, and lust and, and really the essence of politics because it seeks to, to gain favor with man. It, it's always been there. But we as Christians still have an obligation to make our voices heard through our vote. And through our vote, we establish our dependence upon God's word and not the deceptions of man. That was simply a side note. 
Um, well, it's a good side note. Those are my views. Those are my views as, 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 a, as a citizen in this world. Those are my views as a Christian. Those are my views as a, a pastor that's been instructed to lead um, a body. You can take those for what they are. If you want to chuck all those, you can chuck them. Um, but those are my beliefs, and I believe they're biblical beliefs. But let's get back to today. As we look upon a landscape that seems to continually crumble and, and trend toward darkness, right? I think we can agree that, that society and culture is trending toward darkness. We can find comfort and encouragement in Scripture. And Psalm 23 is one of the most recognized and recited Scriptures, and for good reason. It is very much a psalm of proclamation as well as dependence. In Psalm 23, David speaks with confidence and an unyielding trust that should be contagious to every Christian follower. So let's spend the rest of the morning digging into this wonderful chapter. It's a, it's a very short chapter, and I would bet if you grew up in church, you, you have this whole chapter memorized, um, or it's very familiar, and if you didn't grow up in church, you are in for such a treat today. Now, there is no doubt that Psalm 23 is it's founded within the mind of God and, and was inspired by the Holy Spirit to eternally testify to the greatness of God and the insurance that each one of us can walk within these same attributes. So as we go through Psalm 23 today, you might be sitting there going, oh, that sounds so wonderful. Oh, I need that. If I could only get that into my life. I want you to understand that every one of these attributes that is spoken about here is available to the Christ follower. That should get all of us excited because once again, we are living in a time of weariness. Sometimes it's just hard to get through the week. Psalms 23 expresses how God cares for us and provides for those who call upon him, follow him, and know him. That's an important distinction there. It's, Psalms 23 is all about those who have committed to call upon him, to follow him, and to know him. So Psalms 23 isn't a, a universal truth that is extended to everyone, but it's extended to everyone in such a manner that if we choose to follow God, we can accept those things that Psalms 23 is offering to each one of us. See, we see that God cares for us and how he cherishes us. We see in this psalm how he extends his unfailing and perfect love to his people. And it is believed by many theologians that, that David wrote this psalm later in life, right? Um, he had seen a lot. Remember, David grew up and he was a shepherd, right? And he took care of the sheep and then he was thrust into really this battle with David and Goliath. He was anointed as the true king of Israel, even though he had to step back from that and not assert that anointing because he had to honor Saul, the current king. And, and man, David had troubles and tribulations and he had great victories and he became the greatest king that Israel had ever known. So it's believed that, that David, when he wrote this psalm, was was reflecting back on his entire life. And he very much recalls the time that he spent as a shepherd in his youth. And now David recalls those times and, and he can relate the love of God for both himself and his people. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a situation like this later in life? Um, sometimes much later, you you've thought back and, and been able to relate to the situation that you maybe were in, that you had to walk through, that you, that you were blessed to be able to 
walk through. It's that situation, a relationship, a circumstance. And now that we're through that, we can look back and, and we can see how God taught us through that time in those acts, in those situations. You guys ever experience that? It's pretty amazing. Sometimes we think back to before we ever came to Jesus, to before we were ever a born-again believer in Jesus, and we can, we can say, oh God, even in those times, you were watching over me. Even though I resisted you and I ignored you, and, and I wouldn't acknowledge who you were, you, you were playing a part within my life. And that's an important thing to do. And that's what David is doing here. And you're able to relate those things. God seems to use all our situations, both positive as well as negative, to draw us closer to himself. We just need to have the eyes to see it. So let's start with verse 1 here. Verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. We start out with a, well, it's really it's a word picture, right? It's symbolism, and it's frequently found in the Old Testament. God compares himself to a shepherd in order for the reader to better comprehend the relationship of God and of his people. The shepherd is much more than the one who simply oversees the flock. The shepherd is a protector, a provider, the one who leads and guides. The shepherd is also the one who rescues those in need. The shepherd has a special relationship in that he has a love for his flock, which enables him to watch over his flock with, with a deep passion and a sacrificial love. And David is making this relationship personal in that he says, the Lord is my shepherd. Right? He's not declaring that the Lord is a shepherd. The Lord is the shepherd. David is saying, no, no, no. The Lord, he is my shepherd. I wonder, is, is God your shepherd today? Jesus uses this, this same picture to establish that he, in fact, is the good shepherd within the relationship that we have to him. In John chapter 10, Jesus declares who he is and the love he has for us by defining the shepherd. It's, it's verses 11 through 16. It says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, that I'm one of those others, right? Remember Jesus? He's hanging out. He's teaching. He's, he's, Jesus is Jewish, so he's talking to the Jewish crowd, and he's telling the Jewish crowd, right, that, that he, in fact, is the good shepherd. And, of course, because of situations and and because of oppression um, throughout the ages and, and currently because of the oppression of, of Rome over them, they have segregated themselves, they have elevated themselves. We are Jews, everyone else is Gentile. So Jesus is explaining this and he's telling them, and the Jews must have been going, yeah, you're our guy. You are our guy. You are sent to lead us out of bondage and captivity. That's who we believe the Messiah is and what the Messiah will do. And Jesus comes back and says, you got to understand I'm the good shepherd and that I will lay down my life. And there's a lot of sheep other than this fold, other than just you guys. And, and we're going to bring those in. They have to also be brought in. 
because there is to be one shepherd and one flock, and that is the church, right? The body of Christ. Now, unfortunately, many of the Jewish people have have yet to receive that. So though Jesus spoke these words to the Jewish people, many of the Jewish people are outside of the flock that we call the body of Christ because they've denied Jesus and not accepted that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior, and the the shepherd. So if we go through this in John, it's, it's, it's kind of David, through the Holy Spirit, spoke it so many centuries beforehand. And now Jesus is really completing. He's putting the pieces all together, saying, it is me. I am the good shepherd. For those who ask us, well, who who is Jesus really? We can take them to John chapter 10. Jesus is the good shepherd, the one who is willing to lay his life down to save the sheep the one who will establish one flock with one shepherd. It's called the church age. It's what we're we're currently living in. And this is such great affirmation to who he is and the love that he has for each one of us. Does anyone find this encouraging, especially in the times that we are living in? Psalms 23.1 and and John 11-16 through affirm two truths that we can stand on. First, first truth, God cares for us and is concerned about each one of his children. That's a godly truth. It should just rock us to the core of our being. God loves us. God loves each of us, and he is concerned for each one of us. He desires to love us, to care for us, to guide us, to protect each one one of us, to the point that the good shepherd that we find in Christ was willing to sacrifice his very life for each one of us, to die for his flock so that his flock may live. This is the ultimate and defining characteristic of the good shepherd in contrast to merely, merely a hired hand who runs away when, when the wolf pokes his head up. Second, as believers, we become the good shepherd's beloved sheep. We are brought in to the sheepfold. We belong to him through our born-again relationship. No longer are we sheep who have been led astray, wandering this wretched and dangerous world where the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus, our good shepherd, has come that we may have life and have it abundantly. That's John 10.10, 10, right? It comes right before John 10.11. So we can claim the promise we find in this psalm when we respond to his voice and we follow him. So Psalms 23.1 allows us to have confidence in the good shepherd's ability to sustain us. We're going to go verse 23.2. It kind of is an overlap with with the first verse, so we're going to treat it as such. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Ooh. I mean, you guys could use some green pastures and some still waters right about now. This is all about what is good and what is necessary for us. See, sheep, they don't always know what they need. Sheep are not very smart. They don't always know what's actually best for them. So sheep need a shepherd. They need to be guided and led by that shepherd. This this passage right here is so near and dear to my heart because sometimes I need to be made to be still and to lie down. Did you notice that? It said, he makes me. (laughs) A lot of us need to be made 
to be still and lie down. Sometimes, sometimes I just need some still waters. And the important part here is, is that it needs to be done by the good shepherd's leading. God not only leads me, he stops me when necessary. And he stops me in places of, of green pasture and still water where there is life and there is nourishment and there is protection. And it is here I can rest in peace away from fear, allowing the comfort and counsel of the Holy Spirit to nourish me. Some of you guys in here, man, you just need to lay down for a little while in green pastures and still waters and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. And if you don't do it voluntarily, sometimes God invokes the I make. You ever had that situation? Boy, I have over and over and over. Man, I'm gung-ho. I want to do all this stuff. And God says, I don't want you doing it, but it's for you, God. I'm going to do it anyway. And then I am actually made because he knows what's best for me. See, green pastures and, and still waters are where God guides us so that we can just linger there. They are places where refilling and renewal and health comes. And I think we all need to have times of replenishment and health. So Psalms 23.2 allows us to have rest and nourishment because of the good shepherd. Let's keep going. Verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Have you ever been discouraged, depressed, or dismayed? How about frustrated or pessimistic? Oh, pastor, do you mean more than just this morning? Yeah, I do. See, we're, we're all there from time to time. And when I get this way, it's only the good shepherd that can restore me. And according to Psalms 23, he does. And not only that, he leads me in the direction of my perfect purpose. Did you know each one of us have a perfect purpose? My perfect purpose is his righteousness. Now, isn't it interesting that this comes after he has made me lie down in green pastures and by still waters? Don't try to find your perfect purpose on your own because it's not going to happen. Rest in the Lord when we need to rest in the Lord. Linger with him when we need to linger with him. And then we can hear him. And that restoration can come through that. So Psalms 23.3 allows us to have restoration with the good shepherd. And if you tell me, nah, I'm good. I prayed the prayer once. I don't need any restoration. You're lying to yourself. Now we are going to get a dose of reality simply because we live in this world. Verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Walking through the valley of the shadow of death sure seems inevitable from this passage, doesn't it? Oh, Lord, far be it from you, but if I were ever to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. No, it's when. It's not if. It's when. Verse 4 is simply a wonderful gift of the good shepherd's presence, right? There's quite a contrast here between these green, lush pastures and, and these calm, still waters and the dark valley the harsh valley, the painful valley of the shadow of death. And yet David conveys a confidence in the Lord that helps us to understand that I would rather walk with God in the darkest times than without him in the best of times. As long as God is with me 
or I guess a more correct saying, I should say, as long as I am with God, there is no reason to fear, be it from evil or anything else. Though the enemy may prowl around like a lion, that enemy is no match for the good shepherd. The implication of a a rod and a staff symbolizes God's strength, power, and authority. It is His strength that I rely upon daily to survive this world. It is in His power that enables me to live a life of confidence and triumph. And it's in His authority that I submit myself under, and this includes the discipline that I need from time to time, right? So this rod and this staff is both for protection, but it's also for discipline. Because sometimes the valley I find myself in is very much self-induced because of a lack of self-discipline. So the fact that his rod and his staff comfort me shows that I need protection from things that are outside of my control, but I also need discipline for things that are in here. And that's what the Good Shepherd does. So verse 4. It's all about the authority that we can live under. The authority of the Good Shepherd. On to verse 5, and it's, it's a really great one. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Even as my enemies try to destroy me, God cares for my needs. So even though we get confronted by the enemy daily, and even though we are surrounded on all sides by an ungodly culture and society. God sustains us. He not only gives us what we need, but in so many ways he gives us what we enjoy. Not only that, as if that was not sustaining enough, God not only prepares the table We eat together in close close relationship. Because of this, it becomes less of what he is providing me and more about his presence. Anointing the head with oil was a practice extended to honored guests. So when you'd have have something at your house and you set the the banquet table and and you're waiting for everybody to come in there was an honored guest and when that honored guest came in their head was anointed with oil and it was to show honor right it was like hey this is what this is all about this is for this person we're gonna we're gonna anoint him but it also is uh, something that the shepherds would do for the sheep anointing a, a sheep or pouring oil over its head was used to protect them from flies and other insects that would get into their face and become a nuisance. But it could also be life-threatening. Some of these, these insects could carry parasites, and, and if those sheep were infected, that parasite could go to the brain and actually kill the sheep. Boy, that's some word pictures and symbolization there, right? Because there's things, parasitic things in this culture that seek to infect us and get into our brain, isn't there? The oil for the sheep, it repels the insects and it helps soothe the sheep so that they can be peaceful again. If you're having crazy thoughts, if you're having weird, crazy, out-of-this-world kind of thoughts that, you, that are very abnormal, if you're battling that right now, Accept the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that he may get that parasitic spirit ideology out of your head. And with that, he can restore peace again. The symbol 
of an overflowing cup here, it refers to what was known as the shepherd's cup, which was a large hollowed out stone that could hold 40 to 50 gallons of water where the shepherd would bring the sheep to drink. Nobody wants to worry that, hey, I'm this far back in line. I hope there's enough water, right? The shepherd took care of that. He had more than enough water. It was overflowing. So don't ever think that, that God is too busy dealing with something else, right? God is never too busy to listen to you in your times of worship, in your times of need, in your times of, of excitement, and in your times of peril. So Psalm 23, 5 attests to the pro protection and the provision provided by the good shepherd. And that brings us to verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Reminiscing on the good shepherd's care brought the goodness and mercy of God to David, and he lived, he lived within that faithful expectation throughout his entire life, all the days of his life. As I walk with the shepherd through this life, I too will receive constant guidance, help, goodness, and mercy. No matter what life may throw at me, no matter what happens in this world, I can trust in the Lord that he is good in all circumstances. And now we get to this powerful, confident, wonderful declaration to end this psalm. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David, in his calm assurance, proclaims that he would enjoy the presence of the Lord forever, both in his current days as he's writing this psalm on this earth as well as forever. That's, that's this whole um, idea of having this eternal perspective. When we're born again into the kingdom of God, our eternity starts at that moment. We don't have to wait to live a life in accordance with God. We start right now. All the days of our life, from now until eternity, I will dwell with the Lord. This is probably something that we need to be proclaiming and living out every single day. Wouldn't you agree? Psalms 23.6 is about living a life in the Lord now and forevermore. This is an unsettled time we live in. Psalms 23 reassures us that as long as we submit to the Good Shepherd, the Good Shepherd will take care of us. We can have confidence in the Good Shepherd. We can find rest in the Good Shepherd. We are restored by the Good Shepherd. We can endure all things with the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd is our provider and our protector, and the Good Shepherd will never leave us or forsake us. Worship team, if you guys want to want to come up here. I want to end with a passage that we find in Hebrews. And I'm going to read that. We can read it together in a second here. But as the worship team begins to play and we, we are led back into worship, I'm going to pray. I absolutely want to open these altars up today. Treat them as a time of prayer, time of worship, time of thanksgiving. If you've got stuff going on, if you are dealing with that weariness or anything else in your life right now, I would invite you to get to the altar. There will be people that might just lay their hand on you and, and whisper a prayer. And you might say 
man, would you just pray with me? I need you to pray with me. I, I've got this going on or that going on. And, and there'll be other people up here just simply worshiping the goodness of God, proclaiming everything that we just read about in Psalms 23. So let's end with this passage from Hebrews 13. And then we will open up these altars for whatever needs you might have. It's Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Everybody stand up and bring the lights down if you wouldn't mind. Father God, we thank you and we are in awe of you. We thank you that, that you are the good shepherd. We thank you for the symbolism that we can understand that you are the shepherd that cares for his sheep. You are also the shepherd who protects us and provides for us and and you are the father who sent his only begotten son the good shepherd in order to die for each one of us that though there may be sheep on the outside of the sheepfold the good shepherd will always welcome and bring them in Lord God we thank you that once though we walked apart from you that we are now within your sheepfold. Jesus, we ask that you continue to guide us, to prepare us, to provide for us, to make us stop when we need to stop, to gain nourishment when we need the nourishment. Lord God, when we're in the valley of the shadow of death, Lord God, your very presence changes how we see that situation. Lord God, the table that you set before us, it's restoration, it's nourishment, but the fact that you set it in order that you want to eat with each one of us, Lord, that's companionship and that's relationship. And Lord, for us to be able to say with confidence, not only now do I dwell with the Lord, but forevermore. Lord God, we proclaim these words. Jesus, you're amazing. Jesus, we need you more. Yes. Jesus, in the times of our weariness and worriness and fearfulness, our depravity and our depression, Lord God, you are only one step away. So Jesus, we call upon you. Lord God, I ask that you meet needs in here today. Lord God, those going through so many different things, Lord God, be who you need to be to each person in here today. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And everyone said, Amen. The altars are open.